promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a land. Specifically the land of Canaan. To be their inheritance. The book of Joshua is essentially the fulfillment of God's promise to them. It is the giving of the land to the descendants of Jacob according to his promises. According to his word. Last week, we considered how the book of Joshua begins and how God commands Joshua to go over the Jordan to possess the land that he is giving to them. We reflected upon Israel's failure originally to believe this promise, wavering in unbelief because of the military strength of those who inhabited the land. Even though God had said that he would go before them. That he would send his angel before them to drive them out. Before they even entered into a covenant with God. He had promised what he would do in driving out the inhabitants of the land. But even though he had promised that, the people wavered. And refused to believe and refused to then enter into the land. Their unbelief led to rebellion. Consequently, all those that were numbered amongst the fighting men... All the fighting men, being 20 years and older, were judged and for their unbelief and rebellion against God's command to take up the land. They died in the wilderness and their carcasses littered the land. All except two. The two spies that went into the land and were the exception from the other ten who said, let's take it. God has given it to us. Let us go up. And they appealed to the people of Israel not to rebel. Their names are Caleb and Joshua. These two men were the sole survivors of that generation. Would lead this new generation of fighting men into the land to take possession of it according to God's promise. Now while both of these men were great. And as God, as God testifies in Numbers uh, chapter 32 and verse 12, that they wholly followed God. They wholly believed God and they followed Him. It is Joshua who was personally selected by God to lead the people into the land to take possession of it. Moses had sinned against God. At the waters of Meribah and Kadesh, he had failed to sanctify the Lord in the eyes of of the people and an anger struck the rock of which God had told them to speak to in order to provide water for the people. And as a consequence of his disobedience, God had forbidden him from leading the people into the promised land. And so God said to Moses, you won't go over, but Joshua will lead the people Look with me in Deuteronomy. We're going to do quite a bit of turning around in Deuteronomy, Joshua, and maybe a bit of numbers. But Deuteronomy chapter 3. <clears throat> it is interesting that when God announced judgment on Moses and, and said, go up to this hill that you're going to die on. Moses said, please appoint another leader. And who was it that God appointed? Joshua, son of Nun. Look here what, what we see in verse 27. It's actually interesting within the context here. After he, he encourages Joshua, he then appeals to God once more. Please can I go in? God says no. Don't ask me again about this matter. Verse 27, and then he says, God says, get thee up into the top of Pisgah and lift up thine eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and behold it with thine eyes. For thou shalt not go over this Jordan, but charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people. And he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. So we abode in the valley over against Beth Peor. You know, that's around Mount Nebo. That is 
you know, uh, when it talks about the top of Pisgah, we're looking at Mount Nebo there, where he was able to look out over the land, but God says, you won't cross the Jordan. We thus come to the end of Deuteronomy, and we witness the death of Moses and the transfer of leadership to the people of, uh, of the people to Joshua. Look at Deuteronomy 34, verse 7. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land. And in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses shewed in the sight of all Israel. <laughs> it's that final description of Moses that I think is pertinent to the start of the book of Joshua. Put yourself in Joshua's shoes. The only one who had ever led Israel as a nation was Moses. And he brought them out of Egypt. Obviously, God using him with great power. God used him to sp split the Red Sea. They saw all the mighty judgments that God afflicted the people of Israel. Worked through the hands of Moses. He had gone up to Mount Sinai and spoke to the Lord face to face and brought down the law. And was the mediator of the covenant between them and God. He then led them in the wilderness these 40 years. And now he was dead. And Joshua, his servant, Moses' servant, was to now take over the leadership of the people. That's how the book of Joshua begins. Look at verse 1 and 2. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now you will recall that the people before, the generation before, had wavered in unbelief. Because of their fear of the inhabitants and the strength of the people inside the land. They were afraid of them because they were big and strong and heavily fortified. Now, after Moses had died, Joshua was to lead them across the Jordan. To conquer the land. How would you feel? I am certain that in the mind of Joshua there was a level of anxiety and apprehension. Apprehension of the task that God had given him. Why do I say this? Well, because we have numerous statements leading up to Joshua chapter 1 and including Joshua chapter 1, where God seeks to assure Joshua and calls him to be strong and courageous and to not be afraid. You know, we have a tendency, I think, especially when there is a strong leader, we have the tendency to put a reliance on our leadership. People do that. And the moment, and I, 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 let me just say this, it should never be that way in the church. It shouldn't be. You should be, your focus ought to be Christ, not the man, not the under-shepherd, but the shepherd in everything. But there is a tendency to put our reliance and our trust in leaders, especially when you see somebody like Moses. 
who stood up to arguably the most powerful nation on the earth at that time, stood up to Pharaoh. And through his hand, grape up. The ones where they said, Moses, you speak to God. We don't want to speak to him. We're terrified to hear his voice. You speak to him. And God went up, and Moses went up to the mountain alone and spoke to God face to face. Incredible. Came down from the mountain with the Shekinah glory of God shining off his skin. They were terrified of that. Put a veil over. Now he's gone. God, I believe, understood some of these things. Because God instructs, as we read just a few moments ago, in chapter 3 and verse 28 of Deuteronomy, He said, Joshua will go over. Therefore, encourage him. Strengthen him. Because he will take the people over to take possession of the land. God knew that Joshua's heart would be troubled and sought to encourage and strengthen him for the role that God had placed upon him. And thus we come to this well-known portion of Scripture in Joshua chapter 1, where God commands Joshua to be strong and courageous. Let me, let me begin reading as we did in our Scripture reading, but I want to read it again. Let us have a look at verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, uh, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou mayest, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now if you've ever heard of the conquest of the land, or ever read Joshua, you know, you'd be familiar with this portion of Scripture and God's command to Joshua to be strong and courageous. No doubt, you've even heard sermons preached on it. Three times, God gives him this command in this passage. Three times, be strong and of a good courage. Now, two of those times, he gives a reason. The third... Time, the third one that he gives, you know, has to do with obedience. Be strong and courageous that you might observe. But the other two is be strong, and he gives a reason. For, this is it. Be strong, for this is it. I want to focus on those two this morning. And then next week, the other one. Okay? What's interesting, I believe, you know, I find it interesting, maybe you won't, but I do, is that this isn't a new command for Joshua. From the moment that God appointed him to take over from Moses, this has been the assurance given to him and to the people of Israel. You're there in Joshua, flip over backwards a few pages to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31. And I want to read verses 1 through 8. There's a couple of things here that I want you to observe <clears throat> as we read this portion. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 1 through 8. And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am 120 years old this day. 
I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. Now like I said to you, that likely could have caused a sense of unease amongst the people. Because now their leader was not going to go with them. The one who they have relied upon to lead them in the wilderness, to interface with God, was not going with them in this land to conquer these strong and mighty people. But look at the assurances that now Moses imparts to the people and then to Joshua. The Lord thy God, He will go over before thee. And He will destroy these nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them. And I want you to, as I'm going to mention these, he mentions two kings here. I'm going to come back to these two kings in just a bit. Okay? But I want you to remember these two kings. Even put your bulletin here or a finger here, you know, because we'll definitely return back to it. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sihon and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you, which is... To absolutely destroy their high places, to remove their city, destroy them. Verse 6. Oh, we've heard this before. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all, all Israel, Be strong. And of a good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them. And thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee. Neither forsake thee. Fear not. Neither be dismayed. Notice that this was before his death. Moses gives the same command to the nation of Israel and to Joshua specifically. Be strong and of a good courage. God then calls Moses. Here, in verse, verse 14 of the same chapter, look, look at what it says. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy day is approached that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. What charge did God give Joshua? Well, have a look at verse 23. And he gave Joshua, the son of Nun, a charge and said, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. This command to be strong and courageous was given to Joshua by Moses and then by God even before Moses died. And now in Joshua chapter 1 he says, Moses my servant is dead. And he re reiterates the same command. Be strong and of a good courage. Be undaunted by the opposition. And let's be, let's be clear. The opposition and the people he is about to go up against were fierce. We ought not to minimize how strong the inhabitants of the land was. And it would cause any normal person to go, I don't know. Be strong. Strengthen yourself. Be undaunted by what opposition you face. And he gives two assurances. And every time he does it in Joshua, and he does it here, there's two assurances that he essentially gives for this courage to steal himself, to, have, to be without fear. Look at verse 23, then in Deuteronomy 31. It is reflected in Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and of a good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel 
into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. There's two assurances there. Firstly, it's the assurance of God's promise. And secondly, the assurance of God's presence. And it's on those two things that that command, be strong and of a good courage, hinge on. And it's those two things that also are important for us. For us to equally be strong and courageous. Do we struggle with the fear of man? You need to be doing this. Yes. Yes, we do. And that's why Jesus said, fear not them that can kill the body. But fear him that can kill both body and soul and health. There ought to be a fear of God that overcomes that fear of man. But we do have a fear of man. God has something for you to do. He has called you to be witnesses. To go out and proclaim the gospel. Is that terrifying to you? <coughs> to go and stand before people you don't know? And to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you know what the number one reason why people do not share the gospel? Fear. Fear. We need to be strong. Courageous. There's a lot of similarities here that I want to show you. The command first, be strong and courageous because of my promise to you, Joshua. You will notice there in Joshua 31 verse 23 that God follows that command. For thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them. Keep your finger there in Deuteronomy 31. We flip over to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 6. You'll see a very similar statement. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Notice there are two aspects to God's assurance here. The first is that this land I swore to them. I swore to give it to them. To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. The second is that Joshua... You will be successful in bringing them across and dividing up the inheritance that I have given to them. Moses may be dead, but the promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob continues. And as Moses sought to assure the people, I may not be going over, but God is. The promise is the important factor in success, not the leader in question. It wasn't Moses who guaranteed success, but rather God who was faithful to keep his promises. Joshua's strength and courage were to be drawn from the certainty of the fulfillment of God's promise. God's faithfulness assured success. And thus he ought to strengthen himself and not be afraid of what lies ahead. And what the people would face. The land was theirs. God had given it to them. And that's how he begins here. Before he even says to Joshua. You know. Be strong and courageous. He begins by saying. Go. Verse 2. Unto the land which I do give to them. Even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot. Shall tread upon. That have I given unto you. As I said unto Moses. From the wilderness of this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Success is assured because God swore that he would give it to them. God's promises and his faithfulness to keep those promises ought to be the ground of our resolve to do what he has called to do, what he's called us to do in our walk with him. The assurance of our victory over sin and death in Jesus Christ. Eternal life and an eternal inheritance ought to establish within our hearts a fearless resolve. Knowing that he is faithful to do what he has promised. God's promises to us assure us of the end. 
Do you realize that? God has promised us. This is the end of it. Whatever you might face in this life, eternal life, through Jesus Christ. By faith. An eternal inheritance that will never corrupt or ever, ever fade. A new body. You will. <laughs> it's interesting. Eternal life, no, amen, but new body, amen. <laughs> you know? And you might, the promise that we will reign with Him. That He promises that in all the sufferings we might face, He will work it to our good. Which is what? To be conformed to the image of Christ. He's given us the end. It's His promise to us. But if we know the end, we can be confident in the present. Facing the trials of life with the knowledge that He will work it all to the end that He promised. It's a guarantee. Isn't this not the basis of the Apostle's command in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, when he says, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What was the context? When this corruption has been cloaked with incorruption, this mortality has been cloaked with immortality, when the, the saying becomes true that death is swallowed up in victory, where are death? Is thy victory. Where, O death, is thy state? Is not that the basis of the command? Thus, be steadfast. Unmovable. The end should strengthen the present. Shouldn't it? We see the same in, those, in, in the promises of God, where, which in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1, those promises that Paul lays out, that He will dwell with us and we will be His people and He will be our God. And He says, because we have these promises, come out from them and be separate. Don't live as the world lives. But separate and sanctify your hearts unto the Lord. God's promises ought to embolden us and strengthen us in our resolve to live for and to serve Him. It is certainly the basis and the reason that He gives here to Joshua. Be strong. You are going to divide the land up that I swore to their forefathers. But secondly, be strong and courageous because of God's presence. The second assurance is the promise that God would be with him. And how many times does he assure Joshua of this? There in Joshua chapter 1, look at verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. What? Because he's a great military strategist? Because he's a, he knows jujitsu? <laughs> no. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Look at verse 9. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee. Whithersoever thou goest. Look at, go back to Deuteronomy 31. What does he say there in verse 8? 31 and verse 8. This is Moses speaking to Joshua. And he says, And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. And look at verse 21. Moses comes to Joshua. Verse 21 of Deuteronomy chapter 3, And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes, is, eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou passest. Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God shall fight for you. What's the promise? You know the greatness of Moses was not found in the man, but in the one who was with the man. 
The very first thing that God says to Moses when he sends him to Pharaoh was his assurance that he would be with him. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 11, Moses goes, Who am I to go to Pharaoh? And the response of God in verse 12 of Exodus chapter 3 was this, Certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought them forth, the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. What mountain? Mount Sinai. That's where the burning bush was. It was on Mount Sinai. Indeed, God's presence was evident in Moses as God used him to bring Israel out of Egypt to the promised land with great power. With the same assurance, which he even says in Joshua chapter 1, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Consequently, as Joshua 1 verse 5 says, there was not a man that would be able to stand against Joshua. Not because, as I say, Joshua was a great military commander, but simply because God would go before him and fight for him. Notice what, what he says, what Moses says there in verse 21. When he, he points to something to give Joshua an assurance, he says to Joshua, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. Which two kings was that? The ones I told you to take note of a little bit earlier. Sihon, the king of Heshbon, the king of the Amorites, and another king, King Og, okay? Og, the king of Bashan, also an Amorite king. Now, it's very interesting what it says about these, these two kings. Um, these two kings were two Amorite kings that ruled on the east side of the Jordan River. And I know I, I put up a... You can't really see that too much. I'm sorry, but um, it is what it is. Um, but I want to show you something here. <clears throat> the Israelites came up in, in, in Numbers 21. They came up through the land of Moab. Okay, this is Moab over here. Ammon is over here. God said, don't touch anything to do with Edom. Okay, that's, that's land I've given to Esau. He also said, likewise, don't touch anything in Moab. And don't touch anything in Ammon, which would be around this area over here. He says, because I've given that, given that to the sons of Lot, okay, as a land inheritance. But as they come up to this river, there's this river here called Arnon. And they come up to here, God says, I've given into your hand, Sihon. Now Sihon, his kingdom went from Arnon, the Arnon River to the river Jabbok, here, this area over here, Sihon, and there's Heshbon, right over there. And <coughs> Og is at the top here, all of this area in Bashan, okay? In all this area reigned Og. And so as they come to this river, Moses requests, I'd like to cross through your land. Says this to King Sihon. <laughs> King Sihon wants nothing to do with that. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 2. You're right there. Look at verse 31. 31. Sihon said, absolutely not. I won't let you come, come through my land. And in verse 31 it says this. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have, given, I have, I have begun to give Sihon in his land before thee. Begin to possess, that thou mayest inherit his land. Then Sion came out against us, he and all his people, to fight at Jehaz. And the Lord our God delivered him before us. And we smote him and his sons and all his people. And we took all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain, only the cattle we took for prey unto ourselves and the spoil of the cities which we took. 
Here, God is judging the Amorites. Make no mistake, it's judgment towards the Amorites. And he's using Israel to do it. And he says, I have given you. Go in and begin to possess his land. And who's the one who delivers Israel? It says there in verse 33, it's God that delivered us. Look at now in chapter 3. After, after the Israelites completely destroy, and we need to understand that they completely then destroyed all the cities and the kingdom of Sihon in this area, completely obliterated them. None could stand before them. There was not a city or a stronghold that was too strong. In fact, he says that in verse 36, not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all unto us. Now in chapter 3 and verse 1, we see Og, who's up here at Ashtaroth. He hears of the demise of his, his fellow king, Amorite king. Look at verse 1. Then we turned and went up the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edre. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sion, king of the Amorites, Amorites which dwelt in Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him until none was left to him remaining. We took all his cities at that time, and there was not a city which we took, not from them. Three score cities. Three score cities. All the region of Argob and the kingdom of Og in Bashan. Now that's, that's important. Because when we actually have a look at it, by the way, that's the land they conquered. They were unprovoked attacked. Okay, they were provoked. You know, they, didn't, they weren't looking for a fight. Sihon attacked, Og attacked. Now Og's quite a big deal. Because Og was a huge dude. Okay? Dude is not a theological term. You won't find it in the Bible. <laughs> but notice what it says of Og there in chapter 3. Verse, uh, um, by the way, this is the lad. Verse 8 of Deuteronomy chapter 3. As I'm showing you here, it is there. We took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites the land that was on this side of Jordan, from the river of Arnon unto Mount Hermon. That's that area, and a huge amount of area. And look at what it says of, of, of Og in verse 11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. The Rephaim that dwelt in this area over here, okay, during the times of Lot and of Abraham. You know, the Rephaim, the, the giants, big guys. In fact, how big were they? Well, we know of Goliath. We know how of Goliath. But here, wasn't, he wasn't nine cubits. His bed was. Okay? Now, I don't know how big. We're not just talking about... A, this is a king-size bed. Okay? So big was he that it had to be made out of iron. Okay? And it says here, you know... Um, as Moses brings this to their attention, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is, not, is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? It's got a museum. Nine cubits was the length thereof. That's about 13 feet. And four cubits, the breadth of it, six foot in width, after the cubit of a man. So his bed was 13 feet. Now, I don't think it was just because he rolled around a lot. Okay, this guy was a big guy. Why was that important? Because when the people spied out the land in the previous generation, they said, we saw the giants, the Anakim, the sons of Anak, you know, from which Goliath would have been descendant of within Philistia. Big guys. Moses says, look at what you did. Look at what what God did to these two kings. And as he destroyed them before you, and you inherited all of this land, 
so you will when you cross over the Jordan. He will go before you. He will fight. He will drive them out. You don't have to fear the giants there. You saw what we did to Og. They were nothing. We conquered all of those cities. And so that promise comes. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you. I will fight for you. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the promise then is to be strong and courageous because God is with him. We will see the acts of God that he works through the hand of Joshua within this book. And you will see for certain that not a single foe, you know, um, would, would not be vanquished. None would be able to stand against Joshua because God was with him. The promise was that he would never be left. He'll never be abandoned. God's out and God's presence would be ever with him. So you don't have to fear a single person on this earth. I go before you. Don't fear their cities. Don't fear their might. Don't fear their chariots or stature. Your success is guaranteed because I will be by your side. So be not afraid. Be not dismayed. Do you know that Joshua, that wasn't his name originally? Did you know that? That wasn't his name. His name was Hoshea or Hosea. We see that when the spies go in, it lists the names of the spies of which Joshua was one. And in verse 8, it says, Of the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun. Do you know what Hoshea means? Salvation. It means salvation. Moses renamed him. It says in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 16, it says this, These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. Hoshea means salvation. Jehoshua means Jehovah is salvation. Or the Lord saves. Jehoshua. Don't you think that's fitting? You know, isn't that fitting in light of the assurance that God gives to him? It wasn't going to be Joshua who was going to save the people and... and and overcome the might of the people. No, I, the Lord, will go before you and bring, put them into your hand. I wonder if you had that assurance, if you had those same promises, would, how would you respond in standing where Joshua stood? Would you be like, yes, courage, man. I'll go take on, you know, come on, you know? Hey, would you be strong? Would you strengthen yourself and be of good courage? If you had those same promises and assurances that God says, I will be with you. You will do it. These promises are sure. Would you be the same? Would you fear man? Would you be concerned of the future? But it has been given to you, hasn't it? You should know these statements. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. God assured this to Moses and then to Joshua. You know what I love about the Old Testament? Is you see God's word in action as God takes action. And they are written there for our examples that you may see the hand of the Lord worked out through history as He fulfills His promises. So that we might take heart when He gives promises to us. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. I realize I've gone woefully over. And I'm sorry for that. I'm marginally sorry. But I am sorry. Hebrews, I'll end here. But Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse 5. I think this was a heart and mind challenge not so long ago. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what does it say? Verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. 
And be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Do you see the, the parallel? Be not afraid. Be not filled with dismay. He speaks of covetousness and discontent here, which are often the products of unbelief. And a failure to see our sufficiency in God. <laughs> when you fail to see that God is all you need, you will be filled with covetousness. I need more and discontent. I have to accumulate more because it seems like with more, I will find security. With more, I will not be afraid. Ah, but our security is in God. The command is thus to rid ourselves of these sinful ambitions and to reflect upon the assurances we have received. received. We needn't be fearful of any person or any, any situation because God has assured us, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. The Lord, as with Moses and as with Joshua, has promised to go before us. And He will ultimately bring us into our inheritance. There is that promise. Again, has He promised us an inheritance? He has. And He says, I will get you there. And I will be with you every step of the way. Since He is our helper. What circumstance or foe have we to fear? What man could overthrow the living God? The assurance of His promise to us and His abiding, abiding presence ought to fill our hearts with strength and courage to do what that, that which He has called us to do. Joshua, I want you to do this. But He said the same to I want you to do this. Follow Him. Serve me. Bear witness of the gospel of Christ to this world. You will face opposition. Take heart. The faithfulness and testimony of God in the life of Moses and Joshua ought to serve as assurances of God's abiding faithfulness. If He was truly with them as He said, is He not then likewise with us as He said? Fear and anxiety... And those human pursuits that accompany them spring from a failure to remember the assurances that God has given you. We are called to be strong, steadfast, immovable. To serve the Lord without wavering. Not because we are strong, but because He has promised to fulfill what He has given to us. And He has promised to be with us. When we read the assurances that God gave to Joshua, we tend to think it is only for him at that time in that place. No, my friends. We fool ourselves. We fool, fool ourselves into thinking that if we had been in Joshua's shoes, we would have done what he did. But you are. Are you strong? Have you strengthened yourself and not afraid? And go out with assurance to do that which God has called us to do. Be strong and have a good courage. He has given us promises. The assurances of promise, promises that He will fulfill. And assurance of His presence. Let us then be like those that have gone before us. And take God at His word, not wavering in unbelief. And doing what God has called us to do. To live for Him and to serve Him with our whole heart. For He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for the assurances of Your Word and the examples that You set before us. We are grateful for the testimony of Your Word. Grateful for the promises that You have given us. The assurances that You will always be with us. That you go before us. We know even now that we have such a great adversary that brings accusation before the throne. And yet we have our Redeemer, our Advocate, 
that stands and fights on our behalf. Lord, we just thank you. May we thus not be afraid of any man, of any circumstance which might befall us, but that we would strive to serve you where you have placed us and to do that which you have called us to do faithfully. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.